Okay, welcome to our second week of class. Let me click over. This is going to work. Yep. Welcome to our second week of class. Remember, the structure of our syllabus is every week we uh, will be asking ourselves a different, like, big question, right? Um, and this week's big question is what is the philosophical life? So we asked ourselves, what is philosophy last week? Okay, so we uh, investigated what how we might define philosophy, what the practice of philosophy is, what its value is, right? We read Russell for that. Um, and this week we're taking it a little bit deeper that it, it's in a lot of ways, the same kind of question, at least the, the way in which we're, we're uh, introducing and beginning our uh, philosophical inquiry or the, the questions we're gonna ask throughout the semester um, really begins with a like, what is philosophy kind of idea. Um, and where last week was, I don't know, you could put it more on the theoretical side. This week, we're going to see philosophy done in practice as like a lived quality of experience, a lived life kind of way. Um, and we see that represented in uh, the defense of Socrates against his accusers in the court of law. Okay. Um, so uh, before we jump off into the actual philosophical content for tonight's lecture. I wanna cover some uh, administrative bases. So first off, uh, it's been, uh, well, well, I'll say this much. I'll answer a question that I got through a few emails about um, when I'll be putting in grades and all this. Um, so I have to grade all of the discussion boards manually, which tends to be, uh, a little bit tedious, especially right at the beginning, um, and is kind of hard to do when there's not already some discussion already there. So what I've done in past semesters um, is I'll wait till like two weeks or 10 days or so before the midterm, and then I'll grade all of them. Um, and then from that point, I'll be pretty on the spot with grading them as they come in. Okay, so... Um, you'll know about two weeks before you take your uh, midterms if you wanna to decide to take your midterm. Um, but it just makes it like a little bit easier for me to grade. I did like read through um, everything that had been written on them like as of two, three days ago, something like that. So um, uh, I, I look at them, I just, you know, haven't, Put the mental energy into grading them yet, which will happen so with enough time for you to, you know, make an informed choice about choosing to take the midterm, which leads me to the second bit. Um, you've had a week now to sort of uh, incubate your thoughts on how the course works administratively, right? So the way that I've set up the class is different. Um, it's not a typical course structure. So uh, I want to like put it back on you guys, at least for those of you who are here, do you have any other questions? It, it, like any questions at all, even if it's answered on the syllabus, whatever, if you're thinking it and you're unsure, then it's almost certainly uh, uh, an unclarity that's shared by your classmates. So feel free to ask, are we all like comfortable with how the class works? Do we have any questions, um, concerns or comments before we move on? No, feeling good? Thumbs up guys, doing okay? Great, okay, so um, if you do end up having any questions, email me, right? I'll, I'm really responsive. Uh, email is my favorite way to procrastinate my actual real work. So um, I'm usually pretty good about responding. Uh, for those of you who are new to the class, uh, we've had a bunch of new additions permission codes and everything, you know, enrolling last minute. Um, take a look at the syllabus, uh, watch last week's lecture video posted on YouTube, get caught up. Um, and if you have questions, reach out to me privately. Okay, so let's get into the content for today. Um, the examined life is our uh, big target for today. What is the examined life? Why is it the, the life that's worth living according to Socrates? Well, last time in class, we surveyed several definitions of the meaning of philosophy. Uh, one of which was good reasoning, right? Like learning how to think well, so to speak. Um, the art of thinking and questioning, right? So it may not just be uh, a kind of uh, in principle setting in of 
uh, rules of logic, of inference, modus ponens, modus tollens, uh, not affirming the consequent, these sorts of things, right? It, like it, it may, philosophy may have something more to do with uh, an art, right? That it's a kind of uh, artistic practice, pulling out the, the beauty of strands of thought, of forms of inference, of drawing together uh, the threads of our worlds and uh, binding them in wonderful ways. This might be philosophy too. Um, it could also be a science of argument, right? Very similar to the good reasoning sort of thing. Um, that when we're doing philosophy, what we're interested in, uh, in the same sort of way that a geologist is doing the science of rocks and earth history. Uh, the philosopher is doing a science of argument, um, trying to pull apart the, the disparate pieces, the premises and um, uh, hidden inferences and uh, assumptions and, and whatnot that are present in ideas, um, reconstructing them into arguments or finding the argument that might be present uh, or not. Um, we also talked about philosophy as therapy, right? That the practice of doing philosophy itself can be a therapeutic one. Uh, so I think I'm almost certain I mentioned this. I mean, I, it, you know, it all kind of gets muddled together when you're doing stream of consciousness like this. But um, I'm almost certain that I mentioned um, the skeptics and the cynics and the stoics last week, um, how these are all early um, post uh, Socrates and Plato. Um, schools of philosophic thought um, that uh, had philosophical uh, underpinnings, right? Like the whole practice was one of philosophy, but the purpose was not to like discover the truth. Uh, primarily, it was sort of like a secondary falls out of what um, you're doing anyways. But what you're doing anyways is to, is performing this therapeutic practice where um, the method with which you philosophize is one that is good for the heart and soul, good for your existential being. And all of these different definitions are great and each might capture in itself a part of what philosophy is. But if we're to understand philosophy, right? Not just like have a conceptual theoretical um, idea of it, but truly to like understand it to when, when someone says, uh, like this is a philosophy to, to not just sort of use that word in the colloquial sense, this is kind of what I think about this, but rather to understand what it is to live and examine philosophical life, which is something much more uh, robust, deep and, and full of uh, nuance and intricacy than you know, the colloquial meaning of like my philosophy is this, right? Um, to, to really understand what we mean by, mean by philosophy, um, we have to see it in practice. And I think there's, really no better expression of philosophy and practice than the Socratic dialogues, personally, in my personal opinion. Um, but it's also sort of special in reading Plato's Apology. Um, we are reading the very first uh, inspired moves of philosophy in the Western world. Um, so when we think of philosophy today, when we think of really science, argument, thought in general, um, it begins here with what we read. This is the start of it all, the genesis of philosophy. And um, we have Socrates, the, the character here, um, sort of similarly poised as, as like a Jesus character, right? Like he, he's almost the, the martyr sacrifice um, for the sake of reason rather than for the sake of, you know, like a spirit or whatever as it would be in Christianity, but a similar sort of parallel there as well. Um, but yeah, in, in the, there were philosophers before Socrates and before Plato, but um, they didn't quite do philosophy in a way that's entirely recognizable to how we think of it. What Plato is doing in writing his dialogues and, and in this um, first seminal important dialogue, the Apology, um, we see, like I said, those first motions of philosophy as we would recognize it today um, being written down uh, and importantly dealt with. Uh, in the ancient Greek world. Right, so there's no better place to look for a philosophically well-lived life than in Socrates, the man, the myth, and the legend. Okay, so some historical preludes. So before we, we actually get to the apology itself, uh, what I'll do is talk a little bit about um, the philosophy that was going on before Socrates, uh, and then some of the 
fun history, like the political dialogue at the time, because the political background is really important to um, why the the story is framed as it is and there's a whole lot of little hints here and there like and i'm learning all the time like every time i reread the apology um i mean i love reading it. it's, it's a lovely work um, but this time I, I caught something that was kind of interesting when socrates is mentioning chirophon which we'll talk about um the context for that later but he mentions chirophon as one of you meaning like the uh, accusers who are the Democrats, right? So Chirophon is more than just like the, the person through whom Socrates says the story about him being the wisest man in Athens comes about, but Chirophon is also supposed to be like this political bridge. Like you should trust what Chirophon says because he was a Democrat like you. Um, but to understand any of that, we got to get to like the political background. So, so let's dig in. Um, there were some philosophers prior to Socrates, um, unsurprisingly, we call them the pre-Socratics, right? Because everything is supposed to begin with Socrates, recognizable Western philosophy. Um, so before that, it's just pre-Socratic philosophy. Um, oftentimes called the first of these, um, sometimes even called the first scientist is Thales, um, who says, it's all water. Uh, the designation scientist, scientia, like a, a person of uh, rigorous knowledge, scientia would be, rigorous knowledge is a pretty rough translation of the Latin there, but um, it, it wasn't designated until the 1800s. But like insofar as uh, philosophy is natural philosophy and moral philosophy, um, Thales is kind of doing it all and he's doing it scientifically in a sort of proto-scientific kind of way. Um, what he's interested in is the underlying substance of nature, um, which he thinks works formally like water works. So when Thales says it's all water, he's not saying that, uh, look, what you thought was a rock is actually water. He's not being so literal. He's saying that the form of, that the principle of motion and of like substance that inheres in that rock uh, is derivative of the form of substance and motion as it inheres in water. So from water, we can learn about the natural principles that apply everywhere else. Um, and this is a really common strategy. So what the pre-Socratics are doing philosophically, and even if we want to call it scientifically, scientifically as well, is what we would call today cosmology. Um, so trying to find the principles of the cosmos, logos of cosmos, right? Um, and insofar as they're doing cosmology, they're asking really big questions like, what is everything? What does it consist in? What is it like? Um, and not taking any small part of it, like uh, we might do today in a scientific study, we control for all of the extra features of the world that might make our, our data noisy, right? Um, and we find one really tiny little quality of the world and of life, and we measure it. And then we say, look, we discovered something. What these pre-Socratics are doing is kind of like the exact opposite. They're zooming all the way out um, and saying, what is all of it? How does it all hold together? Um, which might also be unsurprising if these are like the first people to really think in this way systematically, um, that they would start, you know, from the beginning, the, the, the biggest questions and just over the, the thousands of years that of thinking and of um, analysis that we've done since then, we've, uh, you know, gotten to the point where people are interested in pinpoints of knowledge rather than, you know, massive cosmologies. Anyways, Thales cosmology is, it's all water, right? Um, Heraclitus, kind of the opposite, in a, I suppose, astrological sense, opposite. Um, Heraclitus is a super cool figure. Uh, he was like his, he, he had a strange persona um, that the people, I think he was from like Solomon or something, they thought he was a madman because he lived in this mountain and he grew a wild beard and he only came down to, to talk to people. I don't even think he talked to people. The only time he like left the mountain, he was the, the weird spooky sage hermit living up at the top of a mountain that, that like had no human contact. And so it'd probably like scream at you and a, like a goat or something if you tried to communicate with him. And he was like, looks really concerned in this picture here, right? Um, uh, he said that everything is flux. It's all water, it's all fire. Uh, everything is constant change. Um, and so the, the uh, famous misquote of... Uh, uh, of Heraclitus is that you can never step in the same river twice. 
uh, which I think comes to us from Aristotle via one of like the students of Heraclitus. Anyways, like the, the story of Heraclitus is this crazy madman who comes down from the mountain once and deposits a book at the temple of Minerva and then goes back up to the mountain to continue living his hermetic life. Um, and what we have of uh, Heraclitus in terms of writing is just fragments. It's true of all the pre-Socratics. All we have are fragments. Uh, a lot of them are uh, poems uh, or like poetic in the epic poetry sort of sense. Um, and so when you're doing philosophy of the pre-Socratics and trying to understand their cosmologies, uh, the best source is Aristotle because he's like, he's the philosopher who like had all of them as sources and he would like quote them as we might in a paper today, quote uh, the people who are relevant to our arguments and our ideas. Um, and we don't have the original works of these guys, so we're relying on what there is in Aristotle. Um, but then we do have some fragments, and so it's a lot of like stitching together and just trying to figure out what the very basic principles of their ideas were. And for Heraclitus, everything is in, is in constant flux. It's all change. It's all fire. Right. Um, we also have Pythagoras. If you've taken a seventh grade geometry course, you should recognize this name: a squared plus b squared equals c squared. This is the triangle guy. Um, Pythagoras is an interesting figure uh, because he also has uh, a um, specious, though not in the sense of like it probably wasn't true, but in the sense of there not being any like very reputable sources um, or reliable sources, I should say. Uh, history with like hermeticism and mysticism. Uh, he was a mathematician and a philosopher who was supposed to have he like held together this occult school of other thinkers um, that uh, where Thales thinks it's all water and Heraclitus says it's all fire. Pythagoras says, no, 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 you guys got it wrong. It's all triangles, right? Um, so one of Pythagoras's neat ideas is the musica universalis, uh, which is to say that there's like a resonant frequency of the cosmos uh that everything is sort of like you know vibe into um and there's a mathematical principle to this universal music um and there's i, I don't really know much about pythagoras i'm not sure anybody does um outside of you know like uh guess work and you know um storytelling and whatnot but um the the principle of the musical universal is supposed to have something to do with triangles um, because the triangle is the perfect shape. Um, and he also had this interesting idea, metempsychosis. If any of you read James Joyce, you should recognize this term as well. Uh, the idea is just sort of like a reincarnation sort of thing, that, that he believed in the transmigration of souls, that a soul would move from body to body as it um, moved through the cosmos. Um, Parmenides, I think, is probably one of the most famous pre-Socratics, another interesting figure. He's a monist. Right. So a monist is a kind of philosophical position. Uh, it's a metaphysical position. It is an idea about what the world consists in. So a dualist like Descartes, who we'll look at in, in maybe next week, in two weeks, um, is a dualist. Descartes thinks that there's two kinds of substance. There's mental substance and there's physical substance. Parmenides is a monist. He thinks there's just one kind of substance. Um, and it never changes, in fact. Uh, sort of the opposite of Heraclitus, there's no such thing as change, according to Parmenides. Everything exists, and it's all in complete static stasis. It's all in perfect, complete um, oneness with itself. So not only is he a monist, he's like the like completely committed to a, a absurdly uh, uh, consistent monism. Anyways, here's the argument for it. So just to like give you a sense of why he's important and not just a crazy person saying nothing changes. There's no such thing as time, right? Um, so premise one, either it is, it is not, or it is and it is not. Okay, and this is sort of supposed to like capture everything, right? So either one existence exists or existence doesn't exist, or it both exists and not exists, right? So one, zero, one and zero, right? Uh, but turns out one and zero is an incomprehensible contradiction. You can't have something existing and not existing simultaneously. It's like uh, squaring the circle or having the entirely red ball be blue. It's a contradiction. It makes no sense. It cannot be conceived of. Uh, two, right, it is not. 
is a pragmatic contradiction. So where three is a contradiction, uh, like a logical contradiction, it's like logically impossible. Uh, it's logically impossible for uh, a circle to have square sides and corners, right? It just cannot be. Um, a pragmatic contradiction is a different sort of contradiction. It's a contradiction in substance or in action. So a pragmatic contradiction would be uh, something like, uh, I'm not speaking right now. The content, the, 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 like the meaning of that phrase contradicts my actually like performing it, right? So the idea of uh, two or it is not being a pragmatic contradiction is just to say, well, is it, does the universe not exist? Oh, apparently not, pragmatic contradiction, which leaves us with the conclusion, therefore, everything is. It all exists. Existence is complete and it's total. Does anybody want to come up with an objection? So this is, this is a game that we'll play um, throughout the, the semester, just to sort of preface what we're doing here and to give you a sense of maybe how to play the game well. Um, I will construct arguments like this in premise conclusion format, and I'll ask you what's wrong with it. Uh, and some ways that you can do this are by, like respond to the, the question, are by offering alternative premises that would then uh, break the inferences or the conclusion, say like, um, one is incorrect, we should think that there's a fourth condition, right? something like that. Um, or you could say, look, the inference from one and two to, to three is, is wrong for some reason, that the reasoning is bad. Or you could say, uh, I just think a premise is false, and then I'll ask you why you think it's false. Um, it's a fun game. It gets you thinking logically, doing, again, like the science of argument sort of thing. Um, so does anybody want to try to argue with Parmenides? What's wrong with Parmenides' argument? Are we convinced? Come on, he can't be that convinced. No such thing as change? You're all convinced. I'm amazed. You're all Parmenidean monists. I'll I'll go. Um, right. I I don't agree with it to be honest. Um, Excellent. <laughs> granted, I don't really comprehend it, but I'm gonna give it a shot. Sure. Um, I'm gonna go with, I guess, the second option for my argument, where it's um, incomprehensible. Um, just because matters technically um, different and like it changes, like there's scientific scientific proof that things change in matter and size and anything like that. So I guess that's my argument, and I'll go with that. Good. Okay. So um, the response is to say something like, "Well, there is change." Uh, so it's not one, it would be something more like three, right? The, the like true nature of everything it is and it is not. Um, and your reason was that there's like scientific evidence. Um, so that is an unsatisfactory reason, um, in the, the course of arguments, right? So if you just say there's evidence that that's like, it's not going to convince anybody you would need to give the evidence. Um, so the answer, however, in form is very similar to Aristotle's answer. Aristotle deals with this argument um, in the physics. So uh, what Aristotle does, instead of like saying there's scientific evidence or even like giving what the scientific evidence is, because he's really like the truly first scientist and like, he like invents biology and physics and all this. Anyways, um, what he does is, is he fills in that gap, like the, the, the scientific evidence for change with the, um, the like principles of uh, reason that allow us to understand like what change might mean. So without like getting into it, uh, what Aristotle ends up saying is that the problem with the argument is that it assumes the it is and the it, it is not part are simultaneous. But the way that the world works, right? Like our scientific evidence part, um, 
can be understood in such a way as to break apart the it is and the it is not. So um, great answer, right? This is this is the right way, in in my estimation, um, to object to the argument because what we get is this conception of change. But change can't work with the way that the argument is conceived of. We need a new conception, which might come to us through scientific evidence or other principles of reasoning, where we um, divorce the simultaneity of the it is from the it is not. And then you can have things existing at one time and changing into not existing in another, or like the, the movement of matter from one form to another, uh, if you are a law of conservation sort of person, right? So great. Um, and that's just to say like, it, it, uh, the the objection is pointed in the right direction, um, and you know, like th this explanation has hopefully been to help fill in the uh, rest, like what makes the objection substantive. So good, thank you for sharing. Does anybody else want to try to disagree with Parmenides? Are we all still monists? Are, are we all still pretty sure that everything exists in complete total harmony? Or are we, are we cool with the idea of change? No, okay. Well, we'll move on then. Good, so that's our first, uh, what's wrong with the argument game for this semester. Fun. Okay, so that was some philosophical prelude. It gives you a sense of who Socrates is, philosophical forebears are. Um, let's do some history as well. So uh, Socrates, born 470 BC, dies 399. Um, 10 years prior to Socrates' birth, the Greeks defeat the Persians at Salamis. Um, so the, the, there's this big war. You might have seen the movie 300. Um, similar sort of idea there. Um, and the Persians are defeated. Uh, and the Spartans get super rocked. Uh, and following this war, there's a massive cultural renaissance in Athens. Athens has all of a sudden um, sort of uh, hegemonic control of the uh, wealth and population of the Greek Peloponnese, and so uses it and really like develops all of these uh, conceptions of justice and um, democracy and, and um, uh, we, we, like there, there's uh, like cultural revolution as well. So like poetry is being developed um, and literature and plays and stuff are all being written. It's this huge boom, a golden age for Athens uh, following the, the Persian Wars. Um, but Sparta is not so happy with this. Sparta got their butts kicked a little bit. They, they really took the brunt of the, the uh, um, beating from Persia and they're seeing their uh, polis neighbor Athens doing so well and being the the warlike uh, fascist state that they are want to like get in on some of that uh, some of that good golden age. So what do the the Spartans do? Well, they attack the um, the Athenians and there's the Pel we have the Peloponnesian War. So in 430, um, the entire Peloponnese goes to war, which lasts 27 years. It's a long long battle, um, long war, uh, until 403 BC. And this is the world in which Socrates is a young man, in which he's coming up. He's always constantly at war with uh, Spartans, um, and he's, you know, like a good Athenian soldier. Uh, so what ends up happening after 27 years, Sparta dominates Athens installs puppet tyrants in 404. So what, where Athens was this like, in this cultural renaissance period, they go to war for 27 years uh, and the Spartans win, installing uh, tyrannical uh, overlords in uh, what was a peacefully democratic society. Um, and these uh, tyrants are ruled by this guy, Critias, okay? So Critias is the leader of, of this group called the 30 Tyrants. Um, Critias was one of Socrates' former students or like protégés. Um, it's like he's a young man, Critias listened to Socrates and uh, learned how to argue and be an orator and, and all this from, from Socrates. Um, and this is part of the reason that Socrates is on trial because people are pissed about you know, his being friends with this dude Critias who 
uh, sort of like a Robespierre figure, kills all sorts of opposition, no trials, no due process, no real justice, just, you know, you're with me or you're against me, and if you're not with me, you're off with your head, right? Um, so in 403, one year after the installment of the 30 Tyrants, it does not last long, Athens is taken back under control by democratic forces. And these, these Democrats in favor of peace offer uh, political amnesty to uh, all those who have committed like political crimes prior to 403. So basically what happens, Athens in golden age, taken over by Sparta, um, tyrants uh, installed in the government um, the tyrants go mad hungry with power and murder people left and right. They're overthrown. And because like Athens is now like split right down the middle between um, those who are in favor of uh, uh, like oligarchical power and those who are in favor of democratic power, the Democrats who are now like tenuously back in a safe control of their Senate and their government say like, look, just we're, we're not gonna keep doing all this killing business. We're gonna like, let, let's move on from here. Wipe the slate clean and move forward. So um, one passage that's important to note in the uh, apology concerns Socrates's relationship with his former protege, Critias, right? So um, Socrates not only denies being a teacher, we should remember this if we read, but also uh, having assisted the 30 tyrants in any way. So like what Socrates is saying is like, look, I've never been a teacher and I know you think I was like, you know, buddy, buddy with these guys that I was their um, political advisor, but I wasn't, I didn't do any of that. Now, I'm not a fan of democracy, says Socrates, uh, but that doesn't mean that I helped these tyrants murder all those people. Um, uh, in fact, I have very principled reasons for thinking that democracy is not so great, um, but, uh, you know, that isn't really what's important to me. What's important to me is living the exam in life. So Socrates gets like mixed up in this political back and forth because because he has good philosophical reasons again for for disliking democracy or right? like why give to the people who don't know anything about uh, leadership the power of leadership when you could have a philosopher king or monarch um, ruling the people benevolently. So like the benevolent tyrant is always a superior leader to the the like democratic populace who. Um, are non-experts in you know, leadership and politics. That's sort of Socrates' reason. So Socrates is friends with the 30 tyrants, but not one of them. Uh, and he has like this political philosophical position that's contra the Democrats that have just taken back power, but he's been given political amnesty if he did commit any crimes anyways. Um, but it's, it's in this political philosophical turmoil that we come to the apology. Um, and so here we should pause, okay? Um, the Apology is not written by Socrates. Socrates is the main character of the Apology. Uh, the book is uh, the complete works of Plato, right? So Socrates didn't write anything down. Uh, Plato, who was one of Socrates' like Critias, like one of his protege students, Plato is the one who wrote everything down. Um, and Socrates is a character in the dialogues of Plato. Um, the dialogues of Plato are typically split up into three like units and you know the critical debate about everything, but um, at least at an intro level, this is like a helpful concept to have. Uh, there's the early dialogues, there's the middle dialogues and there's the late dialogues. And in all of them, you know, like 95% of them with the exception of like one maybe, um, Socrates is the main character, but the voice of Socrates shifts in these periods, early, middle, and late, to more and more of a what, what we call like platonic philosophy from a Socratic one. So the early dialogues are really pretty well uh, uh, close to what we imagine Socrates' um, real thoughts um, and how they would have like were and how they would have represented themselves. Um, the middle dialogues we get, you know, like a lot of Socratic quality, but there's also a lot of like Plato really coming into his own philosophically. And then the later dialogues is that they end up being pretty mystical and um, not very Socratic. They, 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 the Socrates in those uh, dialogues does not resemble the Socrates in uh, the early dialogues. Um, so yeah, Socrates didn't write anything down. Socrates is not the, the author, it's Plato, but he is the main character. And at least in the Apology, um, 
we know that this happened. So we have the, the like court records from the apology. Um, so we can, you know, like cross reference the court records from, you know, 399 BC. It's amazing to um, Plato's own work here, but which is a dramatization, um, certainly. Uh, but, you know, like there, there is historical fact and precedent surrounding it. Okay, so apology is it, what, what, what does Socrates have to apologize for? Well, it turns out nothing. It, uh, apologia is the Greek word. It doesn't mean apology, it means defense. It's the before speech, apo before logia speech. So it's the speech that one gives before the sentencing, before the, the commitment of guilt or innocence, right? So it's what the defendant does. They, they defend themselves. They, they give their, their speech, their apology um, to try to convince the jurymen to let them off or to give them the, the punishment that they actually deserve and not what the prosecution wants to give them. Um, the apology is broken up into three parts. There's first the defense, there's second the sentencing, and third there's the final address. So this is the way that all court proceedings would have happened in ancient Greece. Um, the way it works is the prosecution, uh, say like sues or whatever, brings up uh, accusations against the, the defense. Um, and then the defense is given the opportunity to respond to these accusations. And the apology begins with Socrates doing this, uh, just having followed the, the uh, speeches of Miletus, Anatus, and uh, I think there's a third one that I can't remember the name of, um, his accusers. So his accusers say, Socrates is the worst man ever, and he corrupts the youth, and isn't he just a jerk? We should, we should be mad at him. And Socrates says, um, okay, here we go. And the, the, the work begins. Um, now, after giving your speech in defense of yourself, the jury will vote not what to do with you, but whether or not you're guilty. Okay, so this is where the sentencing happens. Um, post sentencing, there's another back and forth of speeches. Uh, and again, we skip the Miletus Anatus accusers speech. Um, what they say is they want Socrates to be punished with death. Okay, so they're, they're saying, look, not only, you've just decided, juryman, uh, that Socrates is guilty. We also want his punishment to be death. Now, the, the typical way of going about this is the defense will then offer their counterclaim of like what the punishment should be. We'll look at what Socrates was later. Um, when Socrates is finally given his punishment, he has a final word. He's the last one to speak. And then, you know, that's that. So we'll go through all three of these parts. Um, the themes that we should be aware of as we're moving forward through this, if you haven't read and you're gonna go back afterwards, uh, be looking for these themes as you're reading. Um, respect for reason over rhetoric, uh, but still quite a lot of respect for rhetoric. It's a really perfect speech. Um, fierce independence. So what matters is um, my living the examined life is uh, my questioning people. It doesn't matter like what the world wants or what society wants or what politics say. It only matters that I'm living this virtuous life, right? Um, humility and pride, you know, juxtaposed against one another. The, I, I know that uh, I am wise because I do not claim to know what I do not know, right? Um, there's a kind of humility there, but then like he's also really tongue in cheek and snarky. He's proud. Um, and it can be really hard to catch the voice of Socrates. Um, even like people who have spent their entire careers and lives who are lauded as like uh, experts in platonic philosophy, um, argue, bicker back and forth about what we should understand as ironic or tongue in cheek or uh, of just having a, an attitude or if it's like really like this, the, the, the irony and pride and humility all like blended together uh, are supposed to be maybe even like a channel through which philosophical content and argument is, is presented. Um, there's a juxtaposition of human and divine knowledge, right? The, what, what's the quote? The, what I've learned is that the wisdom of, of humans is worth little or nothing. And, you know, we don't have access to define, to, to necessary wisdom or divine wisdom. Um, there's also at the same time, in spite of all this like tongue in cheek, like, you know, middle finger to Athenian democratic society, all of his, um, you know, like uh, irony and pride calling himself a gadfly and poking people and saying, hey, you don't actually know that, do you, right? There's also at the same time, a respect for the rule of law and for Athens herself, right? That, that Socrates says, look, I, I was a soldier and I knew to always follow orders, even if it was a death sentence. Um, 
Similarly, I, I follow the orders of, of you know, the gods of my daimon of, of philosophy. Um, and I also follow the will of Athens, that I'm not going to break the laws, but I'm going to do my damnedest to convince you to change those laws to make them more just. Uh, and this is the subject of the next dialogue in the, the early series, um, the Credo. Uh, we get the Persuado or Bay Doctrine, um, where Credo comes to Socrates after he's been convicted um, of his crime and, and committed to death. Credo says, hey, I got a boat outside. Let's go escape jail and get you the hell away from here. And so I was like, no, I, I can't leave. Athens decided, and I'm following the law uh, because I respect Athens, um, which, which I think is a really fascinating um, idea because here Socrates is like, pick it, in the apology, he's picking out all that's wrong with Athens. And at the very bottom of his being, he still respects her more than um, he finds his life to be all that important. And also to stand for a rule by majority. Okay, so Socrates is not interested in these democratic ideas. So like, who knows how to fix horses? The, the assembly of people out in Athens or a horse doctor? Well, clearly it's the horse doctor, right? Um, similarly with the rule of law, who's better at ruling society? Someone who knows everything about ruling society or you know, the people who are farmers and soldiers and merchants and all this, right? Um, and through all of it, the major, theme, the major themes are death, virtue, and a good life. Okay, so the opening remarks, this is, and I have this quoted here, I'm gonna read it. This is where Western philosophy begins. And I think it's a really exciting and very cool moment. Um, so I'm gonna actually read out of my book here um, rather than this quote. It's a slightly different transition. Okay. I do not know men of Athens, how my accusers affected you. As for me, I was almost carried away in spite of myself. So persuasively did they speak, and yet hardly anything of what they said is true. Of the many lies they told, one in particular surprised me, namely that you should be careful not to be deceived by an accomplished speaker like me, that they were not ashamed to be immediately proved wrong by the facts when I show myself not to be an accomplished speaker at all, that I thought was most shameless on their part, unless indeed they call an accomplished speaker the man who speaks the truth. If they mean that, I would agree that I'm in order but not after their manner, for indeed, as I say, practically nothing they said was true. For me, you will hear the whole truth, though not by Zeus, gentlemen, expressed in embroidered and stylized phrases like theirs, but things spoken at random and expressed in the first words that come to mind, for I put my trust in the justice of what I say, and let none of you expect anything else. It would not be fitting at my age, as it might be for a young man to toy with words when I appear before you. And with that, the whole history and course of Western philosophy, really of Western thought begins. Um, these are the words that spark all of it. This is the moment. Um, and it's a really important one because we immediately kick off with irony. We immediately kick off with this like sarcasm, this tongue in cheek, where he's saying like, look, I'm not actually a very good speaker. I'm just gonna like say whatever comes to my mind and I'm not gonna worry about how good it sounds. I'm only gonna trust that what I say is true and just. Uh, and so his interest here is that is in the truth, is in justice, is in the content of what he says and not in the, the form of its dialogue. And yet, Socrates' defense, the apology is lauded as one of the great masterpieces of Western oratory, right? So he begins this masterpiece of oratory by saying, yeah, I'm probably not gonna speak all that well. And, and, and you were convinced not to think very much of what I say. And that's probably true because I'm not a very good speaker, but you should really listen to what I say uh, because that will be just. Um, and then gives like the most perfect form of oratory that exists, which is kind of a feature of um, platonic dialogues in general, that the purpose of the dialogues is not just to forward a philosophical point, which they, that, that's like their main purpose, but they're also forwarding this, these philosophical points with like with perfect rhetorical form. So at the time you have these sophists, these rhetoricians, these people that like go around and actually do what Socrates is accused of. They make the worse arguments sound the better. They're like lawyers, right? Who can convince any jury to think whatever they want them to think by um, you know, saying it with the right sort of like fervor and voice. Um, and Plato and, and Socrates and all of this like school of like philosophers, they don't like this, right? They, they, they're interested in the truth. 
But what Plato does, which is different from, say, like Madman Heraclitus on the mountaintop and uh, different from uh, Thales saying it's all water, it's all fire, it is, and it is not, it is, it is not, right? It's just like this was all babbling. What Plato does in um, using Socrates as a mouthpiece is he takes like the truth and fits it to the form of rhetoric and dialogue, to the form of oratory, which was lauded by the sophists and the rhetoricians. So where the sophists are empty speakers, speak beautifully about nothing, and the pre-Socratics, and maybe even Socrates himself, who, who knows, he didn't write anything down, were babblers. They spoke about the truth, but in incomprehensible, strange ways. It's fire, it's water, what the heck does that mean? Metempsychosis. Um, Plato, and the reason Western thought and philosophy begins with him is because he unites these two strategies, these two features. And here in the very first expression of this Western philosophical tradition, we see um, irony and the blending of these two strategies come together. I won't speak well, and yet the speech is itself uh, as beautiful as it can be. Socrates adheres to all of the classical rules of speech and rhetoric. And why? Is it to be ironic? Is it to shift the focus from uh, the form of speech, which his accusers relied so heavily on to talk to the dreamin, um, to the, the truth? Or is it just a kind of duplicitousness? Um, it's a good question. The important thing to note is that Socrates speaks according to the truth as revealed by his examined, reasoned investigation of life. So regardless of how he orates, speaks, um, that is sort of of hidden importance. And what really matters is the truth as revealed by the examined and reasoned investigation of life. Okay, so what's going on? There are two accusations or two sets of accusations um, uh, raised against Socrates, formal and informal. So the informal accusations um, go something like this. These earlier accusations are more formidable gentlemen. They have got hold of you, uh, most of you since childbirth, persuaded you and accused me quite falsely in saying that there is a man called Socrates, a wise man, a student of all things in the sky and below the earth who makes the worse argument the stronger. Um, and this is true. Socrates has a reputation. And the informal charge here uh, that Socrates is bringing up, his, his accusers haven't said this, that this is not like what's on the court docket. Socrates is bringing this up of himself. He's saying, look, I have a reputation and I should speak to this reputation because it's really the reason that I'm here. Like the formal accusations are, you know, pardon my French, bullshit. Um, and Socrates shows why they're bullshit. Um, and really why I'm on trial is this informal accusation. So I'm gonna address my reputation first. Um, and the, the reputation, you know, is because he's been poking rich, smart, powerful people, telling them that you really don't know what you think you know. Um, and there are like plays written about Socrates where, um, you know, he's made out to be a joke figure. And it's just really people are pissed at him because he's been making them look stupid uh, in the open forum. <clears throat> So in defense of these more formidable charges, the informal charges are certainly more formidable. It's much harder to uh, pull back the veil of reputation and speak to the truth when you are the, the thing that's trying to pull that veil back and using your reputation in the, the practice of doing it. You can't like break the fourth wall with yourself, you know, same idea. Um, so in, in defense of these more formidable charges, Socrates is going to give his origin story, which is like the Chirophon going to the Oracle of Delphi, um, and, you know, the, the, the wisdom of men is worth little or nothing sort of stuff. And then we have what's on the actual court docket, the formal accusations, okay? So Socrates isn't on trial for the former accusations. He brings those up with his own accord. Um, Miletus and Anatus are his actual accusers. Miletus shows up in the Mino. Um, which is an interesting dialogue. It's a middle dialogue about whether or not uh, you can teach anything at all, but really like, can you teach virtue? Um, so like the idea is like, if you need to be taught something, you don't know what it is. Right? Uh, and so when a teacher says, hey, I'm, I'm gonna teach you what courage is, but you don't know what courage is, you just have to trust that whatever they're gonna put there in that space, like what courage is, is gonna be good for your soul. And that's pretty dangerous. Um, and so like transmission of knowledge is impossible and you get the first bit of like theory of recollection, which is that we always know everything 
anyways, that if you take an ancient philosophy class, you'll do the meno. Miletus shows up in that one. Anatus shows up in uh, the Republic. Um, and these are just like looking back at the past dialogues of moments where Socrates pissed these guys off. Now these guys in the Apology are out to get their revenge. And what they accuse Socrates of is one, uh, corrupting the youth, and two, of not believing the gods of whom the city believes in, but rather in other new spiritual things. These are the, the formal accusations that they are committing uh, to Socrates. Uh, but as Socrates does, we will consider the informal accusations first. So here's some cool pictures of Delphi. Uh, if you go there today, it looks like the top picture. And if you were there 2,500 years ago, it would look like the bottom picture. So as Socrates says against the informal charges, I am no teacher of virtue. I do not pretend to be wise enough to do so. Right, like the Mino argument, like, I, I don't know what courage is. I, I, I can't teach you that, right? So again, I, I talked about the sophists. They were like these traveling teachers that would go around and collect the money from uh, rich families to teach their young uh, uh, sons to be lawyers and politicians to uh, convince uh, juries and assemblies to do what, you know, they wanted, right? So the sophists were... Um, people who got paid to uh, make you a convincing young politician. Um, Socrates says, I have a reputation of being wise, but it is not as you say or think like the sophists claim to be wise. So these people are traveling around that you, know, you can imagine like uh, an old beardy man knocking on your door. Have you heard the, the, the truth of, of courage and of, of piety? Do, do you know what these things are? Would you like your son to know what these things are? I know what they are. I am wise in the ways of courage and of piety. So give me five drachma or whatever, and uh, I will impart this wisdom to your sons. Um, and Socrates says, yeah, like uh, I'm said to be the wisest man in Athens, but I'm not wise like they are, or they claim to be at least. Um, the Oracle at Delphi claims that none is wiser than Socrates. So what's, what's going on with the Oracle at Delphi? Um, the oracle was said to like speak the truth of the gods. She was typically like a young tween teen girl. Um, and I don't know the exact history of this stuff, but I do know that um, a lot of these oracle figures were planted on top of mountains underneath like volcanic activity. And the thought is that like the fumes would rise up from the, the volcanic area and like drive the children nuts. Um, and, and I I haven't read this in a long time. So I'm, I, you know, it might just be like one of those sensational articles you read here and there, but I've, I know I've read in the past that, um, that they, they did like a, a, an analysis on the bones of these kids and saw that like they ended up getting like old, but they looked like kids because the fumes stunted their growth. Anyways, just imagine like very high uh, out of their mind, teenage girl children, or like, you know, like stunted growth uh, adults acting like high children um, who are trusted to have the wisdom and truth of the gods. Anyways, one of these um, oracles says that Socrates is the wisest man in Athens. But whatever does the god mean speaking through the oracle? What is his riddle? I'm very conscious that I'm not wise at all. What then does he mean by saying that I'm the wisest? For surely he does not lie. So in investigating the, the oracle's claim, uh, you know, Socrates' friend Chiron goes to the oracle. The oracle says to Chiron, Socrates is the wisest man. And Socrates is like, what does that mean? Let me investigate. Let's find out if this is true or not. So in order to investigate, uh, he he's, goes to those who are reputed to be wise. He says, I've been called the wisest. I don't know what that can mean. Maybe I can figure out what it means to be wise if I go to someone who knows that they're wise already. So I went to one who was reputed to be wise. Then when I examined this man, my experience was something like this. I thought that he appeared wise to many people and especially to himself, but he was not. I then tried to show him that he thought himself wise, but that he was not. As a result, he came to dislike me. And so did many of the bystanders. So I withdrew myself and I thought, well, I'm wiser than this man. It's likely that neither of us knows anything worthwhile, but 
he thinks he knows something when he actually doesn't. Whereas when I don't know, neither do I think I know. So I'm likely to be wiser than he to the small extent that I do not think that I know what I do not know. And this is where we begin to get the conception of wisdom and of the purpose of examination, philosophical examination in the life of Socrates. That uh, all of these people that he's going to end up talking to are going to claim to know things, but they won't have very good reasons for knowing it. And what makes Socrates so wise is not that he has all of this knowledge, that he knows all of these truths of the world, but rather that he has the humility to say, I don't know when he truly doesn't. And so Socrates continues, begins and continues his search for wisdom by asking all sorts of people who claim to be wise. And here's Socrates dialoguing with Alcibiades. Um, interesting history and stories. It, like, if you're stoked on this kind of stuff, look up Socrates and Alcibiades. They, they have a cool back and forth. Alcibiades is just an interesting character in general. Sort of like a traitor and then leader of, Greece, of Athens and back and forth. Anyways, um, Socrates questions first the politicians. He goes to the most politically powerful people in Athenian society and says, hey, I bet you know something. Um, and finds that the more renowned and political power that they had, the more gravitas and um, I'm so important and great, right? um, the more ignorant they were. Right? And what Socrates is doing is he's going to the assembly, he's going to these like open spaces, the, the agora, and uh, deflating, po poking these people in just the right spot to untie the balloon that's filled with their hot political air and letting it out before everybody, pissing off all of that really powerful, important person's friends, including that really powerful, important person, and then really exciting the uh, new up and coming youth, right? The, the young kids in society who see like the, the old uh, gaudy and awful society, um, the old corrupt politicians just get, you know, like the, the political crap kicked out of them, um, the conceptual crap, crap kicked out of them. And they think this Socrates guy is pretty cool, right? Um, we might feel the same way when we see politicians of today get knocked around after being full of hot air, right? So after the politicians, Socrates does not stop. He's just made angry all of the political power in Athens. So maybe we should look to the cultural power of Athens. So he goes to the poets um, and finds that they spew wisdom without being able to explain what they mean. So when a poet says, uh, your eyes are like the roses of the sun that rise with the, uh, from the east in, in the, the morning of, you know, dewy uh, Persephone, you know, whatever, right? Um, they spew a bunch of beautiful sounding, uh, uh, they, they, they speak and write a bunch of beautiful sounding words. But then when Socrates says, hey, what do you really mean by that? The poets say, I, I don't know, right? Um, and, and some of the poets will say something like, uh, well, it's not my knowledge, it's the gods' knowledge, and they're just using me to speak through them, right? The muses speak through the poets. Um, but at the end of the day, regardless of where the inspiration came from, the poet themselves recognizes what they say as wise and, and full of truth, but cannot articulate what is so wise about what they've said and what's true about it. So having now pissed off all of the political power and all of the cultural power, of Athens, Socrates looks to the industrial power. He goes to the craftsmen who do know really truly many things, right? Um, now the, there's different forms of knowledge, right? There's um, the kind of knowledge that you would call like wisdom, Sophia, like philosophy is love of wisdom and its roots. Um, but like Sophos is, is the kind of wisdom that we're looking for here. What the craftsmen have, what they do actually know is called techne, T-E-C-H-N-E -E, with a little triangle over the first E. Um, and what a techne is, is like know how, right? Um, you have a techne if you have a skill. If you know how to build a table, you have the techne of, of the table. Um, if you have uh, sophos of like courage, then you know what it is to be courageous. And these are different kinds of things. Knowing how to make a chair is not knowing what it is to be courageous in a battle. Um, one is like emotive and habitual and the other is like working with your hands, a, a physical embodied know-how. 
Um, so Socrates thinking that maybe these craftsmen with all their techne will have some of that other kind of knowledge too, the sort of sophos, the wisdom. Um, and what he finds is that though they have many skills, uh, they are just as deficient in wisdom as all the rest. Um, and now Socrates has made angry everybody, though he is a very popular cult figure. Um, so as he says, in each case, the bystanders thought that I myself possessed the wisdom that I proved that my interlocutor did not have, which is unsurprising. You imagine a person full of hot air and pride and uh, excitement about themselves, full of ego, and Socrates walks up and invites them to contradict themselves, to make themselves look stupid. Because Socrates isn't saying like, you're wrong, this is actually the case. He invites them to contradict themselves. And uh, in their anger, in the, the shattering and dissolution of their egos, um, uh, they blame Socrates. They think, oh, well, Socrates, he says that he knows what this is, but really all they've done is um, you know, smack themselves in their own face. Um, so what is probable, gentlemen, is that in fact the God is wise, and his oracular response meant that human wisdom is worth little or nothing. And then when he says, uh, Socrates is the wisest man. He says, this man among you mortals is wisest who, like Socrates, understands that his wisdom is worthless. So the informal accusation is that Socrates is a wise man who makes the worse argument sound the better. But Socrates is defense against this informal reputation kind of accusation is that I revealed the worse arguments to be poor, but I do not myself claim to know any better for human wisdom is ultimately worthless. We cannot truly know. We cannot truly have the wisdom of the God of gods. And if I am wise, if I have any kind of wisdom, Sophia, at all, it is because I do not claim to know that which I am truly ignorant or actually ignorant of, unlike these other men who do make such claims. And this is going to come back, this, this idea. I mean, it's like present in the whole dialogue, but it's going to come back in a really important way when Socrates is contending with the idea of death. So Socrates never claims, like, the only thing I know is I know nothing at all. He never claims that. In fact, he claims to know all sorts of stuff. Like, he knows that the examined life is a life worth living. Uh, he knows that um, through inquiry, uh, the Socratic inquiry, the Socratic inquiry, um, like the, the method of question and answer that he employs to get these people to contradict themselves called the Elenchus, E-L-E-N-C-H-U-S. Um, he knows that the Elenchus works in showing that human wisdom is worthless. So, so Socrates knows all sorts of stuff, but it's only the sort of stuff that he can ascertain through the very limited pinpoint scope that human wisdom is able to ascertain, which is through question and answer, through reasoning. Um, and none of that is like necessary divine knowledge, no like capital T truth. Socrates never claimed to have any of that. Okay, so moving on to the formal charges. Um, actually, you know what? Did, we'll pause here for just a second. Does anybody have like questions or comments? Do we have like, like when we were reading, like did, did we get this or did, did we have like issues with Socrates? Did we think he was kind of a jerk or, you know, like, I don't know, just like have a pause here. Anybody want to share thoughts, questions, or concerns with what's going on so far? No? How are we doing? You doing okay? Sticking with it? Good. All right. Then let's... Uh, Continue on. Okay, so we've just discussed the informal charges. Now we're gonna talk about the formal charges and here's where we're gonna get some like actual constructed arguments because this is where we really get like truly constructed arguments. Okay, so if we recall the formal charge number one is corrupting the youth. And it goes like this, to justly charge one of corruption, this is Socrates' response to the accusation of corrupting youth. To justly charge one of corruption, you should know what it means to corrupt, right? So if I say you're stupid and I don't know what it means to be stupid, then I don't know what I've just accused you of, right? Uh, if I call you a block of cheese, 
but I've never, I have like no idea what that is. So um, if I'm speaking a different language uh, and uh, I say, you are a zanahoria, the carrot Spanish is my favorite Spanish word. It's an excellent Spanish word. Um, but say like, I don't know what Zana, I just heard like somebody say that out loud. So I like have the, the um, sounds, but I don't have the meaning. Then what have I really said about you? Just empty sound, right? So similarly, if you're gonna accuse me of corruption, you should know what you're really accusing me of. So let's investigate Miletus. Do you really know what corruption is, what that means? Turns out that Miletus claims that Socrates is the only corrupter in all of Athens. And the argument goes something like this. He says, uh, hey, Miletus, who is it that um, makes the young men of Athens good? And Miletus says the laws. And Socrates says, no, 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 I, I don't mean something so abstract. What I mean is like, like the people. Um, uh, and Miletus says, well, those who know the laws. And Socrates says, who are those? And Miletus says, the jurymen. Um, and Socrates says, well, it's not just the jurymen who know the laws, right? It's also all of the assembly. It's everybody here today. Um, and Miletus is like, yeah. Uh, and then Socrates says, well, why should we stop there? Do doesn't everybody in Athens know the laws? Um, and Miletus says, well, yeah, if you're an Athenian, you know Athenian law. And Socrates says, but didn't you say that as long as you know what the laws are, then you benefit the youth around you? And Miletus is like, yeah. I did say that. That's right. If you know the laws, then you'll share those laws in an Athenian way with the young people in our society. And so Socrates says, well, you have just committed yourself to the idea that literally everyone in Athens benefits the youth, and I alone am the only Athenian in all of Athens who corrupts them. <laughs> it was at this moment they decided Socrates had to die. Yeah, exactly. Um, so apparently, Miletus knows nothing about corruption or the improvement of youth, right? It, it's a reductio ad absurdum. So it's a form of argument where what you do is you show that the, um, the premises of the argument reduce down to this like uh, uh, absurd claim that uh, if we continue forward with the, the commitments of the premises, right? We see what these premises are committed to, we'll find at the end an absurd conclusion. And if the premises uh, of an argument infer or lead to, like with logical necessity, deductive necessity, an absurd conclusion, then we shouldn't think very much of that argument. Um, another form of reductio is an, a reductio ad infinitum, which is to say that the premises never resolve, that they just always continue with further fact. Um, and this is another kind of um, like form of contradiction for an argument. So what Socrates has done here is he's performed a reductio ad absurdum on Miletus, that what you understand corruption to be is absurd. And you've accused me of something that's contradictory and makes no sense given your uh, conception of corruption, your very poor conception, your absurd conception. Therefore, the first charge is unjust. So that's the, the dialogue, I, I just went through it. Um, so Socrates says, look, this is one way of doing it, but I'm not done um, with you, Miletus. Uh, let's, let's really show you what for. So he gives a second argument against the, the corruption of the youth. So Socrates says, look, wicked people do harm to those closest to them and good people do good to those closest to them, right? So this, is, this makes sense, right? And Miletus agrees to this. Um, that if you're hanging around, uh, it, so say you're like a drug addict, right? And you hang around other drug addicts, it's gonna be really hard and you wanna quit. It's gonna be really hard for you to quit. Like they say in AA, the, the best way to get out of the cycle is to like separate yourself from the community that in part determines that cycle. Um, so if you are around people who are performing in a certain sort of way, you will begin to reflect and mirror them. Um, if that's bad, then you'll reflect bad. And if it's good, then you'll reflect good. No person, this is a, a very Socratic injunction. No person exists who would rather be harmed than benefited by their associates. So what Socrates is saying is that we all desire the good, every one of us. Now, some of us may not have as, um, as complete or uh, good, or that's sort of a poor way of putting it, 
uh, as complete or um, well-established understanding of what the good is. So some of us goof up and we do bad things, but we all want to, we're all in the main character as the main character of all of our like life narratives. We want to do what's good. We want to like be good and have good done to us. So none of us in understanding that if we're around wicked people, we'll become wicked ourselves. And if we're around good people, we'll become good ourselves. Nobody's going to want to like be around wicked people because we don't want to be harmed. We'd rather be benefited. So it stands to reason then that either I, Socrates, corrupt the youth willingly or unwillingly. This is sort of like the complete uh, expression of logical space, that if it's true that this is happening, then I'm doing it because I mean to, or I'm doing it because I don't mean to, it's just an accident. But it turns out, if I'm doing it willingly, this contradicts two, like premise two, right? If I, Socrates, willingly harm, the, corrupt the youth, then I'm willingly harming myself, because I'm corrupting the people around me, and the people around me, if they're bad people, they'll make me bad. But nobody wants to be made bad, nobody wants to be around bad people, Therefore, I logically, given the premises and how they fit together here, right, the structure of the argument, I cannot willingly corrupt the youth from four and two. Socrates logically cannot willingly corrupt the youth as it would be a harm to himself and, quote, no man desires to be harmed rather than benefited. But it could also be the case that Socrates' corruption of the youth is accidental, so if it's accidental, then Socrates might indeed be harming his associates without realizing it. But there are no witness reports from the youth of having been corrupted by Socrates. So Socrates asks his friends, Plato and Credo, who are in the audience in the assembly, and he says, hey, have I corrupted you guys? And they're like, nah. Um, and he asks the assembly, hey, have I corrupted any of your sons? And they're like, nah. Um, so probably I'm not corrupting them. Therefore, conclusion two, Socrates neither willingly nor unwillingly corrupts the youth. Okay, any questions about this argument, comments? Still doing okay? Yeah, great. Okay, so that's charge one um, of corrupting youth. Now, there is also a second formal charge, which is worshiping false gods or atheism, and it gets a little tricky how we go about this, but um, the, the way that Socrates responds to this is he says, uh, look, Miletus, what do you mean when you say that I worship false gods? And Miletus ends up saying that uh, you don't believe in any gods, Socrates. And aha, says Socrates, you've just contradicted yourself. You cannot rightly be accused of, of, of worshiping false gods and believing in no gods. So what the heck do you mean, Miletus? Um, but what's wrong with this argument as a defense against worshiping false gods? What Socrates is doing here, why is this a strange legal strategy? Does anybody see it? What's peculiar about the move? It says worshiping false gods or atheism, not and atheism. Yeah, good. So, so what, what Socrates has done is he's, he's said, look, I'm not an atheist, right? So, so the, the, the disjunctive aura there, that, that's good. You caught it. Um, says like, I, I've only answered one part of the accusation, but this defense is not a defense against the like worshiping false gods or like the gods that are not accepted by the city of Athens. Um, and so it doesn't deny the claim of believing in the wrong gods. And with respect to this claim, Socrates does not deny or beat around the bush. He stands his ground. He respects his daimon, the little like soul god thing that speaks in his ear and gives him truth and justice. So here's his example. He says, if your brave leader ordered you to war, you would follow her command. Here's like, you know, liberty on top of a bunch of dead bodies in the French Revolution, same idea. You follow liberty where she leads. And if the God has sanctioned Socrates in his philosophical mission to examine the wisdom of others, then he, Socrates, like the good soldier, must follow these orders. Death be damned if it means forsaking the will of the God and living an examined life. So what Socrates is saying is like, look, if you think I'm worshiping other gods or gods that, that have wishes other than Athens, I can't help you, Miletus. 
and I will be guilty of that. But I'm guilty of it in the same sort of way that a soldier is guilty of standing their ground at their post when it is certain death to do so, that they have followed the, the law and order of their leader. Um, I, too, am following the law and order of the God that has told me to live and examine life, to investigate the wisdom of others, and to seek out um, the, the virtue that comes therapeutically from an examination of life, from living a philosophical life. So Socrates may choose to die by defying his accusers in this way, or he can disobey the God who bade him examine his life philosophically. So he has a choice. Like, I can cow to you, Miletus, and say, I'm not going to do what the God has told me to do anymore. I'll do what you say. But this is to disobey the order of, of his spirit. The, the, the spirit, that little voice itching at the back of his head that says, this is what's right and this is what's good. And Socrates certainly knows that disobeying the God is an evil, but he doesn't know that death is an evil. So if I disobey the, the will of Athens in order to follow the will of God, I will be put to death. But I don't know that being put to death is an evil, whereas I do know that disobeying the God that speaks to me is one. Therefore, it would be better for me Socrates, to choose what I do not know is an evil, death, before I choose what I certainly know is an evil, which would be to forsake the will of the virtuous God and baiting me live the philosophical examined life. Therefore, I would choose death before giving up this examined life. Death is preferable to not doing philosophy. Here we get kind of, you know, like the Jesus kind of figure of martyrdom kind of thing going on. And so Socrates refuses to back down to the second charge. Death to him would be preferable to the abdication of reason, to the disavowal of examination, to the loss of reflection, to the acceptance of the hot air of the politicians, the poets, and the industrial craftsmen. Give me philosophy or give me death, exactly. And so by the narrowest of margins, like very narrow margins, 51 to 50, you know, 49%, the jury votes to convict. And here we have a very deep fried picture of the jury voting to convict Socrates. Socrates is guilty. And recall how the, the trial works. It's whether or not you're guilty and then it's what your punishment should be. Um, it still has to be decided what his punishment is gonna be. So Miletus and Ananus, Socrates accusers, accusers offer the penalty of death. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this, at the outset, it's customary for the accused, Socrates in this case, to offer a punishment um, that they think is fair. And then the jury will decide between the two punishments, uh, the better of them, the, the prosecution's punishment or the defense's punishment, um, what is more befitting of the crime that has been uh, determined to have you know, like actually happened. And because he's guilty after all. So what Socrates says, you have accused me and I have been found guilty. You have said that I should be found, uh, I should be killed. I should be, you know, like made to die for my crimes. And here's what I think my punishment should be. Pay me money every year. Punish me. Punish me with a stipend, with money to live well and to eat. And give me a ticket to the Britannium, which is where all of the Olympians, like the, the winter Olympians, um, go to get like free food, basically. So it's like this like lovely place where all of the most powerful, beautiful, wonderful Athenians go to eat like the best food and live in joy and, and revelry together. And Socrates says, that's what I deserve. You found me guilty of living a philosophical life and that should be my punishment. Give me a bunch of money and let me go hang out with these beautiful Olympians, right? And this is unsurprisingly, a huge middle finger to Miletus and Antis, to his accusers, to the Democrats. But again, Socrates defends what he knows to be right. He will not subjugate himself to the mob, to the majority, nor to his own passions. That is his desire to continue on living. He, he says, look, I didn't bring my, my wife and my kid to court today because I'm not here to convince you uh, with emotions. I'm not here to, to try to play the the 
uh, father, the, 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 the man, the human, what I'm doing is giving you reasons and I want you to decide based on reasons to give me a bunch of money and to put me in the Britannium with all of those beautiful Olympians so I can look up their skirts and be so excited by their um, you know, wonderful bodies. Socrates, you know, it's like a different time in Greece. Um, and he says, look, I didn't bring my family and I'm not even gonna say like, look, give me exile or make me pay a fine. I have no money to pay you, uh, nor uh, will exile work for me. I'm from Athens. I love Athens. I'm here for the sake of Athens. And even if Athens commits me to death, then it's what the will of Athens is, which I respect before everything. Um, and regardless, if I were to be exiled, I would just continue pissing off people wherever I went. And this would happen again and again and again. So the buck stops with me. Um, I will not accept exile. I will not accept death. I will not accept the fine. Uh, I will not accept um, the, the you know, disavowal of my charge. I want you to punish me with the most lavish and lovely lifestyle for being guilty of living an examined life. Perhaps some might say, but Socrates, if you leave us, will you not be able to live quietly without talking? Now, this is the most difficult point on which to convince some of you. If I say that it is impossible for me to keep quiet because that means disobeying the God, you will not believe me and you will think I am being ironical. Here, I think, is like the most important part of the entire dialogue, the most important part of the apology. Because we've had all this talk of like Socrates following the will of the gods, of Socrates doing philosophy of, of uh, blowing the hot air out of the awful politicians and orators and sophists of his day um, uh, because it is like the will of the God who speaks to him. Um, but here we have like a, a little, like I, this is like the tongue in cheek moment as I read it. And so what I'm about to tell you, this is like my reading of it. Don't believe what I say. Um, this is just like an interpretation. Um, and I bring it up because I think it's really important um, to my interpretation of it. And, you know, disagree with me, come up with your own or agree with me and, you know, move on with this. But here, what Socrates is saying, he's like looking, he says, look, if you were to hear me say, I am motivated, why, why am I doing this? Why am I living the philosophical life? Why am I like, like almost certainly dooming myself by asking you to give me a stipend and put me in the Britannium? Um, if I said I was motivated because I believe in the gods and I don't want to disobey them, you would think I was being ironic. You would think I was being silly. That truly cannot be why I am motivated. And the very next line, perhaps the God isn't the real reason. The real reason is this. On the other hand, if I say that it is the greatest good for a man to discuss virtue every day, and those other things about which you hear me conversing and testing myself and others, for the unexamined life is not worth living for men, you would believe me even less. So, when he's talking about his motivations, why am I doing what I'm doing? He says, I, I could tell you that it's because the God told me to, but you'd probably snicker. And you would certainly like completely disbelieve me. It would be so absurd to you if I said that living the unexamined life is not worth living and that we should spend every day discussing virtue and those ideas and concepts around it because that is what the examined life is all about and that is what is virtuous you would find that more absurd than anything else. And I think this like acceleration of like tongue in cheek voice from, you would think I was being ironic to you would find this completely absurd. I think this is Socrates revealing his true motivation that I think he's using the language of the gods. Um, and again, my interpretation, he's using this language of like the gods motivating me of disobeying them as like metaphorical speech as speech that would be um, acceptable and uh, uh, like receivable in a, a charitable way by his, his listeners. The, the sort of people who'd say, I do everything the gods tell me to do. I do it because it's pious and I'm a pious person, right? Um, that those sort of people would be swayed by um, the idea that, oh, well, he's just very pious himself, Socrates, and, and I get it. Um, and, and he's being tongue in cheek when he accuses those people of snickering behind his back. And then he accelerates and says even more, it would be more absurd than that to say that what, 
my real motivation is this living the examined life is virtuous and discussing virtue is what's really important. Um, you'd find that totally absurd. This acceleration is what reveals his true motivation. And this is the heart and core of the dialogue and of the Socratic position of the importance of the, the philosophical life. We see this therapeutic uh, practice and process that is not because of external gods or because of uh, like the power and importance of truth with the capital T and searching for it, but rather for the activity itself. And that activity itself is valuable in itself. And that is why I'm doing it. And that is why I almost certainly doom myself by uh, denying exile, by denying a fine, by denying uh, death and saying, you know, give me what I really deserve, which is um, glory. And unsurprisingly, by a less narrow margin than his conviction, Socrates is sentenced to death. Now it's like 70, 30, right? So where it's like 51, 49 for his conviction of guilt, now he's saying like, punish me with the Britannium is like 70, 30. And so condemned to death, Socrates says, I leave you now condemned by you, but you are condemned by truth to wickedness and injustice. That is a spicy curse, slapping him right back in the face. <laughs> Which is, would you rather be cursed with death or to be condemned to wickedness and injustice as a society, right? That's pretty damn spicy. So now in the final moment, Socrates is given the final word. He's been convicted of his crime and he's been punished with death. Um, Socrates gives us what I think is maybe one of the most beautiful arguments um, in all of Western philosophy. Well, my favorite is the ontological proof for God's existence, which we'll do later in the future um, of this class when we do all of the proofs for God's existence. Um, but I, I just, I think this is an excellent argument. And the conclusion is that death is nothing to fear. So either the dead are nothing, just empty nothing, or um, the soul relocates to a new place, right? That like the soul comes out and, and um, uh, you know, like goes to the afterlife, right? And the Greek word for soul is suke. And in my uh, Plato seminar in uh, undergrad, Dr. Hugh Benson, uh, he said, and he's like a Plato expert. I don't know if it's true, but he said that uh, the word suke, the, the word for soul is what it is because suke is the sound that the soul makes when it like leaves your body, like your dying breath, oh, suke right? That's supposed to be like the soul leaving your body. Anyways, either the dead are nothing, you die and there's nothing, or your suke, your soul, your final breath leaves you and goes to the afterlife. If I have no perception, then death is like a dreamless sleep, which would be an enjoyable fate. Or if it turns out that my soul migrates to a new place, then I may communicate and examine the souls of others who have already died and continue to live the philosophical life even in death, which turns out is also an enjoyable fate. Right? So Socrates says, look, dream of sleep. That sounds really nice. I could use a break. Or I get to go to the afterlife and I get to talk to Agamemnon and Achilles and all of the great heroes of the Trojan War. And I can ask them what they think of courage and of piety and of truth and wisdom and knowledge, right? Uh, I can continue to live an examined afterlife. And that's pretty sweet too. Therefore, death's not to be feared. And it turns out to fear death is itself a kind of ignorance. It's a kind of um, commitment to what death must be in a, in a mode of quality. Like, I'm afraid of death. Oh, God. No, 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 no. Not death. Anything but that. It's to be committed to what death is. Death is a bad thing. If you think death is a bad thing and you're afraid of it, then you are committed to knowing something that you do not actually have wisdom of, right? It's an ignorance to fear death. Because insofar as we fear it, we commit ourselves to knowing that death is worth fearing. But Socrates, and indeed all of us, cannot know what lies on the other side. And we cannot know this with any certainty. Just as we can't know what it is to corrupt with certainty or what it is to be pious with certainty, what truth is with any certainty, that human wisdom in these virtues, in these matters, that all the other dialogues are about and what we've seen in, in the apology here, death is just another one of these concepts that um, human wisdom is able to inquire about, to examine, but never to have a full answer. It's worthless in that sense. And to be afraid of death is to be ignorant of death, to claim to be wise about something about which you have no wisdom. 
And so we are better off not fearing it, but rather to examine it. Give up your fear and, and examine, reflect, ask yourself, is this something actually I need to be afraid of? And ask that question. You will not get an answer if you're doing the Socratic thing. Um, but again, going back, it's not the answer that matters. And it's not the duty that matters. The duty being like what the gods tell me to do. I'm not doing it because the God tells me to do it. And I'm not doing it because I get a, an answer on the other end of my examination. I'm doing it because the examination in itself is valuable, is virtuous, and is what makes life worth living and the unexamined life not worth living, right? So what is the philosophical life to answer, so to speak, our question that we began this week's lecture with? Well, the philosophical life is the examined life. And to seek out the highest good through examination, questioning, and communication. To discuss virtue and being and living together every day with those who might offer us their wisdom. To live the philosophical life is to remain courageous in the face of the frightening consequences of the world and to hold our ground against them with humility and with curiosity. This is what it is to live the philosophical life. This is what Socrates died for because his death was more important than um, forsaking this practice, forsaking reason, forsaking examination, giving into fear and to power and to hot air, but rather doing what he knew to be good and doing it not because it felt good, but because it was actually virtuous, the process of examination of the philosophical life. So Susie asks in the chat, then is it ignorant to fear the unknown, accepting that we don't know death, but to be afraid of it? Exactly. It is, given this argument, it is ignorant to fear the unknown, uh, because it's to say that the unknown is, it has features and qualities that are bad for us, but we don't know what is in the unknown. All we can do is examine it. And rather than being afraid of it, putting it aside, standing it away from ourselves and, and looking at it as, if it as if we know it to be something to be afraid of, we dive head into it. We make the unknown more known. We light it up with the light of examination and the light of philosophy, of reason, and of um, the, the uh, virtue that comes with asking questions about wisdom and truth and knowledge in that unknown. Okay, any other questions? Are we all like ready to face death? Well, hopefully you won't have to for some time. We still got uh, like 10 weeks of class left. Cool. So um, I think next week is Descartes. Is that right? Can anybody fact check me about that? Are we doing Descartes next week? Pretty sure it's Descartes next week. Um, if it's not, then it'll be very soon. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So Descartes next week is um, an extension of these ideas. Um, it's a search for truth and for knowledge. Uh, and Descartes thinks that he can get it. It's, it's Descartes is, is using a very similar strategy um, that Socrates here is lauding um, to justify the new material science, right? So the sort of science that we do today, that the kind of like rigorous, analytic, rational thinking that is involved in scientific peer review and, and process. Uh, Descartes is basically inventing it and justifying it. Uh, in his meditation. So I think I have you reading Meditations 1 and 2, where we get the method of doubt. Um, we'll talk about uh, doubt as a tool. We'll talk about uh, knowledge with a capital T. We'll play a game. What do you know? Do you know things? Let's find out. Um, it's really fun. It's one of my favorite games that we play all semester, um, where I will prove to you that you do not know anything at all. Uh, or maybe I'll get stumped. Uh, but it hasn't happened yet. I you know, still have my fingers crossed that somebody can stop me, but we'll see. Um, maybe next week uh, when we play the game. So uh, enjoy the meditations. Again, like I'm going to say like all of the readings are, are exciting, but I, I won't say that all of them are as exciting as others. Russell's value philosophy is really cool. Plato's apology is spectacular. Descartes' meditations, especially one and two, 
are just really fun to read. They're beautiful. They're, they're like full of storytelling and like poetic asides. And you get the whole like sitting in the armchair, looking at the fire, doing philosophy, thinking about the world. It's very cool. It's very fun. Um, it's pretty easy. It's short. Uh, so enjoy it. It's like one of the most important moves in Western philosophy. Like if this is where it begins, Descartes is where like it blows up. It like just absolutely becomes massive. We get the like, I think therefore I am. So look forward to that as you do your reading. Um, I'll see you all next week. And uh, for those of you uh, watching on YouTube, hope you enjoyed and maybe never see you, but you know, keep up. And again, if you have questions about administration and stuff, always reach out. Um, discussion grades will come in in the next couple of weeks and I'll get on the write-ups. I'll, I'll just be doing those um, probably this weekend and then as they come in from there. Cool. Take care. Be well. Thank Have you. Thank you. Thank you.